chapter 5? Give me a dollar to speed up the sermon. <laughs> okay, Mark chapter five. Did you say Mark chapter five? Mm -hmm. Oh, we should. We should all just leave. Leave them in there with the kids. They'll come out. And they'll be here. Jokes on her. Yeah. All right, Matthew chapter five. Well, she heard it, she's coming back in. <laughs> <coughs> Matthew chapter 5, last week we talked about the dead church, the church at Sardis in Revelation chapter 3. This week we're going to look at, at what Christ expects the living church to look like. We kind of talked about it last week, and we're going to look at it this week in, in Matthew chapter 5. This is, in Matthew anyway, the first sermon that Jesus delivers here in Matthew. And uh, we're going to look at that to see what he says. And I think he lays out here for us what he expects a disciple to look like. And uh, here's what a disciple who's living in the kingdom of God looks like. And so we're going to look at that. But first, let's look at chapter 5, verse 1. And let's see it going into well, his sermon here. It says, And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain. And when he was seated, his disciples came to him. It says that Jesus saw the multitudes. I want to read to you from Exodus chapter 3. You can write it down and read it later. But Exodus chapter 3 verse 7. This is where God is calling Moses to go free the children of Israel. And he calls him by saying, And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. He says, For I know their sorrows. So God tells Moses, he's, he says, I've seen their oppression. I've heard their cry, and I know their sorrow. And so back in Matthew chapter 5, when it says Jesus seeing the multitudes, he saw them. He's seen them before. He's seen their oppression. He's seen their sorrow. He's seen their hurt. And he's seen them, and he's getting ready and to, to tell them what it's like to be in the kingdom. These people needed joy. These people needed encouragement. And Jesus saw them. Do you realize that God also sees and knows and hears your cry? Some of us are facing some oppression. Some of us are facing, are facing some hurt. Some of us are facing some really difficult times in our lives. But God is very much aware of that. And He knows and He sees that and He wants to work in that. And He's going to tell us a little bit about how to have some joy in those moments of sorrow and hurt and pain. And so it says he saw them. And then it says, it goes on and it says, he saw the multitudes, he went on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Now, I've said this before, but, you know, back then it was customary for the teacher, he would sit, and the learners would what? They would stand. I really think we ought to do that during the service. <laughs> I, should be, I should sit down on the step here, and you all should stand for 30 minutes or however long. Would that be okay? You guys will try that today? <laughs> that would be a lot of dollars. He, when he was seated, the disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them. He says he opened his mouth and taught them. I've never caught this before. You may say, well, that's a big deal. But it says he opened his mouth and taught them. Do you realize that you can teach people with your mouth shut? <coughs> By your actions. Jesus had already been teaching them with his life and his actions. But now it says he opened his mouth and he taught them. And so what he's getting ready to tell them is very vitally important. And so he opened his mouth to teach them. <laughs> he taught them it said that if you take all the good advice from all the greatest philosophers psychiatrists, counselors all the best advice and you weed out all of the junk and you put all that together and you combine it together over the centuries of all the greatest thinkers in the world that they would just be a very very poor example of or an imitation of this message that we're getting ready to see 
which lasts several chapters. And so even atheists <coughs> will look at Jesus' teachings that are here and say, this is some phenomenal stuff. They admit that. And so what we're going to see here is vitally important to us in what a living church looks like. Do you realize? Now remember, each of us make up the body of Christ, right? That's what the church is. It's not this building. It's us sitting in here who are in Christ, right? We are the church. And so what's a living church look like? We're going to look at what Jesus says. This is not the message that Israel expected. This is not the... the it's not a political message. It's not a material message. Jesus doesn't come up and say, hey, if you just have enough faith, guys, ask me whatever you want. I think Jesus says this, but he doesn't mean it like some of the TV preachers mean today. But he doesn't say, you can have anything you want if you have enough faith. I'll give it to you. He doesn't say, uh, I'm going to come and I'm going to get rid of all the Roman oppression that you're under and we're going to take care of this and be some political message. That's what they're expecting from the Messiah. But instead, he starts off with this. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And he goes on, which we'll look at in a moment. But he starts off with, blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, I want you to see here that this term, blessed, means happy. But it's a different happy than you and I define happy. I told you before that our happiness, happiness is based on what? Our circumstances. When things are going well, we are happy. But that doesn't, well, that's not what this means here. It's a joy. It means <coughs> a joy that can only come from God, which comes from the Holy Spirit, right? That's fruit of the Spirit. It's a joy that comes when even though you're persecuted or you're hurt or you're sorrowful or you're mourning, it's a joy that comes no matter what your circumstances are. I asked Wednesday night, I said, are we a thermostat or a thermometer? You have to ask yourself, are you a thermostat or are you a thermometer? What's a thermometer do? What's a thermometer do? It tells you what the temperature is. It, it's, it's manipulated or rises and falls according to what the temperature is, right? A thermostat, what? It controls the temperature. And so you have to decide, are you going to be controlled by your circumstances, or are you going to control that? I know sometimes we can't control our circumstances. Do you understand what I'm saying? And so we have to ask ourselves that question. Are we a thermostat or a thermometer? You see, the blessedness, the, the happiness, the joy that he talks about here is not controlled by circumstances. I want to read from Malachi, the last verse of the last chapter of the Old Testament. It's the last thing for 400 years that God prophesied to Israel. And it says this, And He will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Now listen to what the last word of the last book of the Old Testament is to Israel. Catch the last word here. And the hearts of the children to the fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. For 400 years, that's the last word they heard from God, this curse. But the New Testament starts, and I know this was written, but the New Testament in Matthew, the first word from Jesus' message to the people is what? Blessed. So for 400 years, they're stuck with a curse. Now they're seeing Jesus stand there as the Messiah saying, blessed are the poor in the spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Now this is poor, is a, it means truly poor. The Greeks had a word for working poor and truly poor. And this is what Jesus is saying here, is blessed are the truly poor, the downest, lowest of all, the poorest of all. This is the first one of these beatitudes that we call this group. This is the first of the beatitudes that Jesus uses because that's where we start with Christ. If we don't start and admit that we have, we're the poorest of poor and we need a Savior, we cannot do any of the other things He's about ready to tell us to do. You see, truly poor is not based on what we have, but it's based on what we don't have. See, sometimes we look at things and we say, okay, this is all that I have. I'm so poor because this is all that I have. But true poverty 
that he's talking about here is looking beyond this to what we don't have. Look at all the things we don't have. See, we look at this and we feel sorry for ourselves, but true poverty is God saying, look, you're poorer than this. Just look at all the things you don't have. And that's where Jesus is saying, blessed are the poor, the poorest of poor. And guess what? That's you and I. Spiritually. That's you and I. Notice he doesn't say, blessed are the holy or the spiritual or the wonderful or the rich. <coughs> we are so poor, we're spiritually dead, we need a Savior. And he says we got to start right there and admit that, you know, our, this is what the kingdom looks like. He's getting ready to share with us. The kingdom's not given to somebody because of grace or their merit or their excitement or their zeal or their wealth or anything like that. It's given to the poor. It's given to the poor. It's given to those who know they're poor. It's given to the ones that recognize it and acknowledge that I'm poor. If you look at Scripture, you see all the time that, that Jesus gives... That Jesus gives, blesses those who are poor. Those who are despised, the prostitutes, the Zacchaeuses. He realized he needed something more than what he had, his wealth. He gave happiness or that joy, he gave salvation to those who were so poor they knew they could do nothing to earn it and didn't even try. Let me say that again. He gave salvation to those who were so poor they knew it and didn't even try because they knew they couldn't do anything to earn it. If you look at Scripture, it was the poorest of the poor who came to him and laid themselves at his feet and said, forgive me. And he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Again, poor in spirit is first because we can't do the rest of these things. Let's we acknowledge our spiritual poverty. And I hope everyone in this room has done that. Notice verse 4. It says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. There's, again, this is the strongest word for mourning you can have. It's the mourning of a death of, of someone very close to you. It's the mourning of something, someone very dear to you. It's... Some of you have experienced that. I experienced that with my when my mamma passed away. It's the closest person I've ever had that I've lost. And when I heard that news, it, I can't describe the morning. I can't. And some of you have you've been there. Maybe you've lost a parent or a grandparent, somebody close to you, an aunt and uncle that, that's like a, a father or a mother to you. You you know what I'm talking about, or a good friend, whatever. And that, that mourning is so deep, and that's what, he, that's what he's saying here. It's blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, what are they mourning? They're mourning their, their sinfulness. Because they realize their poverty. And they're in mourning. Are you really in mourning of your sin? I stop and I think about, do I really mourn the fact that I am a sinner? That I have sinned against God? This see. Sin, I believe, makes God mourn as well. But can you imagine when it doesn't mourn us and we're not in mourning of our sin and we call sin good or acceptable? A smack in his face. That's why God, it's so hurtful to God when we glorify sin and call it good. Verse 5, he says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now, when he says meek, it doesn't mean weak. Because that's what we think of. Someone who's meek, we think of someone who's weak, and it's far from that. Meekness here is strength in control. Meekness here is strength in control or under control. That's what it means. It's having strength and, and having enough strength to control that. That's meekness. That's true. See, Moses was called meek, but he had an anger issue, right? And that ended up getting the best of me to get to the promised land. But, but he was meek because, for the most part, he could keep that under control. Jesus is called meek, but he wasn't weak. He wasn't weak at all. I mean, he chased out the money changers, right? Twice. That's not weak. So, meekness in here, he says, uh, those who are strength, who have strength under control, blessed are those who are meek, for they shall inherit 
the earth. Verse 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. <coughs> See, once we get, once we get to the point where we recognize our poverty and we begin to mourn that and we walk in meekness, because why in the world? Why in the world would we want to get in somebody else's face and judge them when we realize our own poverty? You know, that's why Jesus says, pull that, pull that little plank out of your own eye before you try to get the speck out of somebody else's. <coughs> and see, we walk in meekness, and then we begin to hunger more for the things of God and His kingdom, and we begin to hunger to grow closer to Him, and closer to Him, and closer, and, and the things of the kingdom. See, it's interesting how God's God's uh, economy is different than ours. He says if you want something, then you give. If you want to be first, you're what? You're be last. If you want, if you want, you know, serve if you want to be served. And so I got to thinking about this. I thought, you know, when I sit down at an all-you-can-eat buffet, <laughs> Shannon doesn't like to go there because people touching the food and all this, you know. I can't get her to go. But I just love to just, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I, when I go to the All You Can Eat Buffet, I always turn and sit the butt. Right? I'm not the only one, right? You just, you, but you won't get your money's worth, right? That's my rationale. Yeah, I paid 10 bucks for this. I'm going to eat till I explode. <laughs> Eventually, after two, three plates, if I make it that far, I can't eat anymore. You're done. Why? Because you're full. And I really got to think about this. You know what? The more that we feast on the things of the kingdom, it makes us hungrier. When, when we, see, we don't have this, this earnest desire right now to just, you know, go pray all, you know, to God or to, to get in His Word or to worship Him or, or things like that. It's just not in our nature. But when we begin to practice that, when we begin to, to create a habit of opening that up, and then when we do, God reveals things and we, we develop a hunger and we get hungrier. I think we get hungrier once we begin to get closer to God. We want more. We want more. I want to encourage you. Practice those things. Blessed. Verse 7. Are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. See, the merciful will show mercy to the weaker and the poor. See, we've come from, if we're in Christ, we should have come from poverty. We've acknowledged that and to, to the mourning, to the meekness, and to the hunger. We should be to the point of, of being merciful to other people, realizing we once were in poverty, and I'm going to treat those who are in poverty and weaker and poorer spiritually. I'm going to show mercy to them. I'm going to notice them. I'm going to offer forgiveness to them. See, we as Christians need to... Here, if you get that, as Mary said, if you get nothing else out of this message, get this. All right? We as Christians have got to stop expecting the world to act like Christians. They're not going to. They can't. They can't. It's like, it's like the, the, the Noah movie. I've heard bad reviews from it. It's, it's, it's unscriptural. Very unscriptural. What do we expect? What do we expect from the world? They're not going to make something that, that's going to be you know, totally scriptural or anything like that. But we, we shouldn't expect unbelievers to act like anything other than what they are. Because they don't have the Spirit of God on the inside of them helping them. And that, believe it or not, it, I, most of you know this, that we can't live the Christian life without the Holy Spirit living through us and producing that fruit in our lives. That's the only difference between me and someone who is not a believer or someone who's lost is I'm just a saved sinner. They're just a sinner. Right? Same with you. I'm no better than you. You're no better than me. We all stand equal up the cross. There's no male or female or Jew or Greek. Slave or free. There's none of that. We all stand totally guilty before God. 
The only difference is, is I've accepted Christ, and because of that, that's the only access I have to the Father. Come on. It's not being a good boy. It's not doing all the right things. It's not praying. It's not any of those things. Those are good. Those are things we should do, but that's not going to get you to heaven. So now he goes to verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now that doesn't mean perfection. It's not what that means. That word pure simply means this. Straightness, honesty, clarity. Blessed are the, the honest, the clarity. The, it means this above all. An undivided heart. A pure heart is a heart that's not divided. It totally belongs to God. There is no compartmentalizing. I'm going to be one way over here. I'm going to do this over here and this over here. And then I'll go to church and I'll be a good Christian on Sunday. And then I'm going to walk out the doors and then I'm going to do all this. No, an undivided heart says God's in control of all of it. He's in the center of it and he has control over all of it. That's an undivided heart. And he says, blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. See, once we have an undivided heart, we begin to grow closer to God. We begin to see God. We, we begin to see God. We get, we get to see Him in Scripture. We get to see Him in nature. We get now. Don't get. Don't say I'm saying nature is God. That's not what I'm saying. We Romans is pretty clear. You can look around and see there is a God by the the, the creation around us, and we can see that. We can see God in the church. When I look at some of you, and when you look at me, hopefully you see God in me. Now you're going to go home and say, Mark said he's God. <laughs> I know you won't do that. I know you won't do that. But when they see, when we see the body of Christ, when we see, we see, that's why we're his hands, that's where his feet, we're called the body of Christ for a reason. We minister to one another. Verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers. For they shall be called sons of God. Now, when you think of a peacemaker, what do you think of? Somebody quickly. When you think of someone who's a peacemaker. Anybody? A referee. Okay, you have two sides. In a peacemaker, we automatically think of there's two factions, and we're going to mediate this thing. We're going to bring peace, right? And we forget that sometimes we're on one of those sides. And so being a peacemaker doesn't just mean we keep the peace between two people. It may be keeping the peace between myself and another person. We neglect that sometimes. That's why Romans says, Romans 12, 18 says, If it is possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. I'll read that again. If it is possible, because sometimes it's not. You know what I'm talking about? You have people in your life, you just can't. It's just impossible. You've tried to live peaceably, but they won't. If it is possible, as much as it depends on who? Yourself. As you. Live peaceably with all men. So blessed are the peacemakers. Maybe there's somebody in your life you need to forgive. Maybe there's somebody in your life you need to make peace with. Look at the rest of that. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called what? Sons of God. They shall be called children of God. They shall be called. See, they'll look at you and see you're a peacemaker. They're going to look at you and see you're me. They're going to look at you and say you've got this hunger for God that I don't have. You're going to look at me and they're going to see all these things in you and they're going to say, that's a son of God. That's a daughter of God. That's what it looks like. That's exactly what it looks like. Now we get into stuff we don't want to get into even more. Verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they pers persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, Jesus, it says here, blessed are, blessed are those who are persecuted. For what? For righteousness sake. That means for Christ's sake. That means for Christ. Jesus said in, in, uh, in John 15, let me just read it to you really quickly. Write it down, we'll get it later. John 15, 18 says, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose 
you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the words that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecute me, they will also persecute you. If they keep, if they kept my word, they will keep yours also. So there's going to be a time maybe we will have to suffer persecution. See, the world doesn't value these things that we're talking about here. They don't value any of those things. Do you, when's the last time you got an award for being poor in spirit? When's the last time that somebody's given you an award for being meek? We don't give awards for that. We don't. The world doesn't value those things. The world doesn't value honesty. The world doesn't value those type of things anymore. It's, it's just, it's just. Remember when you could just with a handshake, you could make a deal, and people kept it. I'm just going to sit here. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Then verse 11, blessed are you who they revile and persecute. Verse 12, now he says, here's what our reaction should be. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. So when you're persecuted for being me, for being hungry, for living as a disciple ought to live, for being the church that God wants us to be, he says, when you're persecuted, be exceedingly glad. That means to jump for joy. Maybe not physically, but inside. To have that joy. See, the early church, they, the, the early martyrs of the church, they literally rejoiced that they had an op they considered it an opportunity to die for Christ. When they faced different executions and things like that. It's recorded in history. The Fox's Book of Martyr, maybe read that sometime. It talks about the accounts of a lot of these people who were martyred for Christ. They counted it a joy to be able to, to die for Christ. They understood what James meant when he said, count it all joy, my brother, when you call, call into different kind of difficulties and trials. Then he goes on and he says in verse 13, you are the salt of the earth. Now we looked at this last week on Wednesday. He said, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and to trample underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. The city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Now, he says, you are salt. We talked about this on Wednesday. We were talking about it being, we talked about this aspect of it. It is valuable. Last week we talked about it. it's, it's, it's a preservative. It adds flavor, we said. And sometimes, a lot of Christians, they know they're salt. And sometimes they're overbearing. You ever put too much salt on something? It tastes really good, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Have a heart attack. <laughs> no doubt. See, it's valuable. It, back in that day, it was valuable. Now here, you can buy a little container for, you know, whatever. A few bucks. Less than that, probably. But back then, it was valuable. They would pay, sometimes they'd pay soldiers in it. That's how valuable it was. And so, God is, Jesus is saying to us, He's saying, you're salt, you're valuable, you're important to the kingdom. You're important to the world around you. Because why? Because if you're preservative. You're going to help preserve a lost and dying world, and, and you add flavor. <clears throat> and what's a shame is, is that too many people, they, they push too hard and, and had too much salt, and they're not preserving the world. They're pushing people away. They taste like a thing of mashed potatoes that you <coughs> put too much salt on, and you like you take the top off and just right. <coughs> pour it out. Something's... Again, it's sad that some Christians, they don't just they don't add flavor. They're so bitter and don't have any joy. You know anybody like that who claims Christ and they're bitter and they're angry and they have no joy and they look like, I always say, look like they've been baptized in lemon juice. They look like a bulldog. He says, you're salt. You're valuable. You're a preservative. You're to add spice. You're to add spice to the world around you. Then he says, you're the light. The light of the world. Now, what does light do? It, it brings warmth, right? It helps us see. <coughs> it brings warmth. Some Christians, unfortunately, they add too much light. And if you have too much light, it burns. 
If you had too much light, you, you get blinded. Don't say anything, David. You know? Not my head either. He says, he says in verse 16, he says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. What good works? Well, verses 10 through 12. That's the good works. Partial. He says they're going to see your good works. They're going to see that you've, you've admitted your poverty, that you are mourned about it, that you're bothered by it. Okay, if the band will come. Seriously.
that say, you know, you're, you're in control, you're number one. No, you're not. Take control of your life and then turn it over to Him. It's time we are salt. It's time we're light. It's time we shine the light around us in such a way that people see our good works and they want what we have. So I want to ask you, will you be that church? Will we be that church? That's where God is leading us. So now our question is, are we going to go there? Are we going to be that church? Are we going to be the church of Matthew 5? I think we do. And I think we will. And as your pastor, as your shepherd, I say, let's go. Let's do it.
forgiveness. We do know that you give us your spirit to live in us, to fulfill all that we've read about today. Thank me. And Lord, I just pray that you just fill us now with that hunger to just seek your face and just to seek your kingdom and just to reach out to the world around us, God, and just to encourage and strengthen us.